This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. Okay, let's carry on with section B of the F9 specimen exam. So if you've not already done so, make sure you've downloaded the exam from the website. Uh, remember, in the real exam, you can do the questions in any order. So it would make sense, perhaps, having had a quick look at what the requirements were during the reading time, uh, to make sense, perhaps, to start with what any topic you found easiest. I'll obviously go through them in order. So first of all, question one. Always read the question first, always. And then you don't waste time. Uh, but required, A, discuss briefly the factors which influence the formation of working capital policy. B, calculated CATCO will benefit financially by accepting the offer of the bulk purchase discount. Now, terribly important here in terms of just the style, the approach. Part A, discuss. That's purely writing. It's six marks out of ten. And remember, you're aiming for at least 50% in every question. Uh, part A, it may be hard to get six out of six. In the middle of an exam, I can never think of everything. But that is very, very standard. Uh, just talking about working capital policy in general. Uh, the information in the question for the moment is completely irrelevant. That's only when we come to the calculations in part B. Uh, and that's only four marks. Now, it doesn't matter which you do first, but too many people spend all the time doing the arithmetic. People like the arithmetic. Even if you get part B 100% right, it's four marks out of ten, you're failing that question. You've got to do a decent written. And don't waste ages for the written ones. Let me, well, several things. So I'm not going, I'll talk through it, but I'm not going to write out a full answer. That could be boring and get us nowhere. Read the examiner's answers. The examiner's answers are always, obviously, perfect. And usually a lot less to read than the textbook. Uh, but at the same time, the examiner always writes more than uh, he expects. Because he knows people learn from it. If it's six marks, generally aim to make six points. But that isn't a hard rule. You know, it's not always one mark per point. When you're going through all the exam questions, look at the uh, marking scheme, which is at the end of the answers, and you'll see how many points are being given. How many marks, rather, are being given to each point. Aim for six. Again, the chances of thinking of six, especially in the middle of an exam, are virtually impossible. But, you know, if you can get three points, you're getting your half marks for that bit, you're on track to pass. That's what matters. And can I suggest, sorry talking a lot, but can I suggest one other thing? <clears throat> the paper's free in the exam, you get an answer booklet. If you fill it, they'll give you a second one. What I would do, you know, head up the page, question 1A. Write down whatever points you can think of. When you, you, know, you should be able to think of one or two straight away. Um, when it start, you start struggling, leave the rest of the page blank, turn to the next page, add it up question 1B, um, and start doing part B, which we'll look at shortly. But having left the whole of the rest of the first page blank, it means that later, if things occur to you, or later, if you finish the exam and you have time, you can come back and add more points. You know, leaving blank spaces, you know, just writing a few lines and leaving the rest of the page blank. That doesn't cost you any marks, and again, the paper's free. Uh, it is a general thing, so I'm not, again, I'm not going to give a full lecture. You can read the examiner's answer, but the sort of points you should be making, just check you understood what he's asking. What factors influence the formulation of the working capital policy? So he's not asking what the policy must be or anything. You know, your policy might have a high level of working capital, low level of working capital, whatever. But it's what factors will you take into account? And I think an obvious factor I'd mention 
is the type of business and other businesses. When I say type of business, oh, if you're a manufacturing company, you're likely, for obvious reasons, to need reasonably high levels of inventories. It's part of the working capital. However, if I'm a service company, I'm a firm of accountants or something, um, I don't think they're likely to carry much inventory. So that's going to be a major factor determining what levels of working capital you have. And I also mentioned, but it's really a separate point, um, other businesses, competitors, Uh, an example of what I mean, um, receivables are part of your working capital. The longer credit you give customers, the higher level of receivables. Well, normally you want to get your cash as soon as possible, but if your competitors are giving two months credit to customers, well, we're not forced to give two months credit, but if we try and make them pay sooner, there could obviously be a problem, we could lose business. And so if our competitors give two months, we're probably going to have to give two months credit as well. But it is a factor we need to check. Uh, an overall thing, of course, is something we mentioned in Section A, your operating cycle. But the overall operating cycle, you know, receivables, uh, uh, inventories, less payables. We want to manage the whole thing together. And uh, one other thing, again, I did mention in part A, but this business of conservative approach, aggressive approach, uh, the approach to risk or the attitude to risk. You know, you have to watch your working capital from a liquidity point of view. We need to have enough in the short term to be able to pay the short-term liabilities. Well, there is always a risk of things going wrong, but the higher the level of working capital overall, current assets, less current liabilities, uh, the less risk there is of having a problem. But at the same time, it costs us money. Those are the main points. I have a feeling that that's just about all, all he mentioned, so he was giving more than one mark per point. Um, for each of them, I mean, what I would do is write a heading, perhaps in capitals or underlining it, and then write one, two lines explaining what I meant. Here I just spoke through it. And always leave a blank line between each point. Otherwise, you know, the marker's marking thousands of pages, they might miss one. But here you can see immediately, oh, there's a point, read a bit, there's a point, you know, um, I get the marks. Anyway, I've kept saying, read his answer. Um, his answers are good. All right, let's do part B. Uh, calculative cat will benefit financially by accepting the offer of the bulk purchase discount. Well, now we do need to look back at the information. And let's quickly read through it. Cat places monthly orders with a supplier for 10,000 components, which are used in the manufacturing process. Annual demand is 120,000. Current terms of payment in full within 90 days, which CAT needs, and the cost per component is $7.50. Cost of ordering is 200 per order, while the cost of holding components in inventory is a dollar per component per year. Well, that now is obviously to do with uh, economic order quantities and things. The suppliers offered a discount of 3.6% on orders of 30,000 or more components. If the bulk purchase discount is taken, the cost of holding components in inventory would increase to $2.20 per component per year due to the need for a large storage facility. So what's happening? And watch, there's one trick here, don't waste time. It tells us we currently place orders of 10,000 each time. In order to get this discount, we're wondering whether to order 30,000 each time, and that's all. We're not asked to calculate an economic order quantity, which is what it looked like at first. 
irrelevant. Um, whatever the economic order quantity is, at the moment we order 10,000 each time, the question is, will it benefit if we order 30,000 each time? So it's pure costing and let's do it. First of all, at the moment we order 10,000 units each time, how much will it cost us over a year at the moment? We'll have the purchase cost. Well, it tells us over a year we are ordering 120,000 units a year. And they're costing us 750. So over a year, Nine hundred thousand. In addition, we've got the cost of ordering. Well, it's hundred twenty thousand a year, but we're ordering ten thousand each time. So there are twelve orders a year. The order cost each time is two hundred. So over a year, two thousand four hundred. Finally, we've got the holding costs. We are ordering 10,000 each time at the moment, so the average inventory, 10,000 over 2 is 5,000 units. And the cost of holding uh, one unit for a year is a dollar. Total 5,000. So the total cost over the year of our current policy is what? 907,400. What are we trying to do? We're wondering if it might be cheaper to order 30,000 each time. So let's try. Repeat the costings all over again, but if we order 30,000 each time, uh, the purchase cost will still need, 100, was it 120? Yes, 120,000 a year. But the cost each time, it would have been 750, but we'll get a discount of 3.6%, which comes to... my calculator, or perhaps it's me. It comes to $7.23. That'll be the new cost per unit. So over a year for 120,000, I get 867,600. Uh, what about the order costs? We still need 120,000 a year, but if we're ordering 30,000 each time, we only need four orders. So 200 each, that drops to 800. And finally, the holding cost. If we're ordering 30,000 each time, the average inventory will be 15,000 throughout the year. And the holding cost per unit, it did say something. Yeah, the last sentence, it will be $2.20 per unit. And so, over a year, this cost will change to 33000 And so, over a year, what will be the total cost on this basis? I think I'm right, 901,400. And what did the question want? Calculate if we'll benefit financially. Well, yes, we will. Instead of paying 907, we'll pay 901. And in fact, you could just state that, and there's your answer. I will actually write down that the net benefit difference between them
uh, 6,000 per annum. And there we are. Uh, two things before I leave it. One is you can set uh, this out in different ways. You know, instead, of, I, I think the easiest is just to cost both out. Look at the uh, difference. You could have calculated what's the uh, saving on the discount on its own, 3.6% of total cost. And separately, what's the extra cost of holding and um, invent, uh, sorry, holding and ordering costs. So several ways you could lay it out, that doesn't matter. A second thing though, terribly important uh, throughout section B, is that although in section A, nobody looks at your workings, and I said don't waste time being pretty, in section B they do, and it's important. Uh, however good you are, even if you found this question terribly easy, anybody can make a silly mistake. You know, simply adding up the figures. A silly mistake is half a mark, but only if they can see what you were doing. You know, my answer is right, but even if I've made arithmetic mistakes all over the place, I've set it out in a way that they can see I know what I'm doing. And so arithmetic mistakes, I wouldn't get the full four marks, but I'd get definitely three out of four even if I've made several little mistakes, which I haven't, here it's right, and I get the full marks. But too often, you know, the markers complain. They can't see what you're doing. And a marker's not going to spend half an hour sorting out because there are figures all over the page. You know, you must be neat. It, it must be clear to the marker what you're trying to do. If it is, you're going to pass the arithmetic bits. If it isn't clear, you're in a terrible risk of failing. Anyway, that was question number one.